And I'm guessing that's they're trying to tell a story in an hour's time while it doesn't actually work that way. Backlog, backlogs aren't unusual for any lab, is it? No, backlogs are commonplace in crime labs uh, and have been for a number of years, probably driven mostly by the advent of DNA analysis for forensics. A um, couple of things happened with DNA analysis. We started to recognize the potential for DNA to help resolve uh, questions in a number of different types of cases. So that analysis and that backlog of DNA has continued to grow year after year because we can find so many different applications for it. The other thing is that the forensic community itself has pushed accreditation and certification of examiners. So accreditation means that you're basically an outside entity comes in and says that they agree you're doing everything properly to guarantee quality results or attempt to guarantee quality results from the laboratory. Well, anytime you implement accreditation and certification, you're going to end up uh, adding time on to every procedure and every process through added documentation, whether it be photographs or notes, et cetera. So those are a couple of things that really in the early 90s started to push the backlogs up. And uh, the other thing is that DNA has now become widely accepted in the forensic community and the courts regularly accept DNA evidence. And because of the way DNA came about, it was very stringency, stringently regulated and this caused every other discipline to then be scrutinized to the level that DNA was. So there's much more that we have to do to be able to go into court and say this fingerprint matches, et cetera. So it's all been good with the exception of the backlogs. Well, to that point, uh, crime rates in general are down, violent crime is down. So why would there be more needs at the, at the lab? Well, I think more needs at the lab is because of the persistent backlog. That, that's going to continue. Uh, the, the biggest reason that we need more forensic input into cases, though, is to take DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence, ballistics evidence from being sort of a reactive type of investigative tool to being a preventative one. For example, in burglaries, most burglars don't just do it once and then give it up. You know, many burglars are career burglars. So if we're able to work those cases with DNA and fingerprints in a timely manner, we could prevent a, a second burglary or subsequent burglaries. The average rapist will rape eight times before they're caught. It's a tremendous cost, not just to the victim's emotional well-being, but across the mental health uh, industry, across law enforcement, prosecution, all of that ends up costing a lot of money. So if we get the cases to the point where they can be analyzed within days of the event occurring, we can go from a reactive model to a preventative model. I think most people are understand that DNA is used for homicides, but uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to know that it's also being used for burglary and property crimes. Yes, we use it routinely on property crimes, primarily burglaries, and have done so since probably about 2007. And we did it as a study. We did an initial study to see how DNA would, would fare in those cases. And what we've discovered is that it's a very efficient, effective tool because we only have to typically run maybe one sample on a burglary case. Say a suspect has broken a window to get in and they've cut themselves on the window typically get a very nice DNA profile off of a sample like that. You only have to run one. Uh, and many times we'll get a hit in the CODIS database, the, the DNA database, because this person has had a prior conviction for something and their DNA is on file with the state. So it's a pretty effective tool when you recognize that for homicides we average about six samples a case that can go up to literally hundreds of samples in a homicide to try and answer a question. So from an effectiveness and an efficiency standpoint, property crimes are very amenable to DNA testing. Well, uh, perhaps maybe we could follow uh, some evidence as it comes into the lab and uh, maybe follow uh, where it goes through, what happens to it. Okay. The crime lab has 15 crime scene technicians that go out to crime scenes all throughout Kansas City 
and they process the scenes for physical evidence as well as collect it, preserve it, and then maintain the chain of custody through proper packaging and storage. These same crime scene technicians also assist outside agencies with violent crimes such as homicide cases. So the first thing that the evidence custodian would do after retrieving the evidence from crime scene would be to enter it into our electronic system, which utilizes software to track every movement of that item of evidence while it's in the laboratory. And it's all controlled through barcodes. So after she enters the item into the computer system, she would then secure it in a different evidence vault that all of the criminalists who work cases have access to. The next step after retrieving the evidence from the vault would be to bring it into the trace lab, prepare the countertop, also prepare themselves to prevent contamination from occurring. As you can see, uh, Ms. DaVinci is wearing a face mask to prevent any of her DNA from getting on the item, as well as gloves. She's placed a clean sheet of paper on her lab bench and she wears a lab coat. This is routine measures that are taken to prevent one item from contaminating another item. So the next step in the process would be for the DNA to be extracted from the biological material collected in the last lab. What the analyst would do is take that sample, cut a small portion of it, place it in a tube, mix it with a variety of chemicals, that would break down the cell and release the DNA. That's the first step in his process, which from start to finish, for a sample, will take about two weeks to complete. Well, you know, on TV, we all get to watch uh, CSI. We got to watch them use super glue to retrieve fingerprints. Is that a trick, or do they really do that? And if so, do you guys get it in industrial strength quantities? It really is used to develop uh, latent fingerprints on non-porous surfaces like this countertop, a laboratory countertop, a kitchen countertop, something that isn't uh, porous and breathable. And uh, we order it in huge quantities every year because we use it every day in processing variety, a variety of items of evidence such as guns uh, for latent fingerprints. And then it's also now uh, amenable to taking it out of the lab and using it at a crime scene. So we use it pretty routinely. I think we're, we're a big consumer of superglue.